I have about uh, four hours worth of notes to squeeze into this one hour, and I've just been sitting here trying to hold it all together. Um, it reminds me of my old... Uh, um, I worked for some years in our family business uh, selling wooden barrels, and I remember that the brandy barrels had to have extra hoops on because the internal pressure was so great that you had to put two extra hoops, and I feel just like a brandy barrel now. <laughs> I don't quite know where to start. I've got eight different pages here. <laughs> and I think it doesn't matter very much. I was telling my wife that uh, one time, uh, six or eight months ago, I, I had to speak before an audience. And as I uh, took my notes out, found they were the wrong notes. There I was in front of a thousand or so people. And it turned out to be very, very pleasant because I, all these, it was like taking the hoops off the brandy barrel. <laughs> what I have here is the, uh, or let me, let me try this trick that I learned during the summer at the tea group in Bethel. Uh, when you're really in a conflict, you don't quite know what to do. Uh, a standard uh, procedure is to say, let me share my dilemma with you. <laughs> What we have, this is the dilemma, what we have is increasingly clearly a, uh, the development of a, of a comprehensive philosophy, uh, something that covers everything. It's a, a, a Weltanschauung, is the good German word, uh, a world view, a view of, a view of life. Uh, and I've been writing down lists of things that are uh, covered uh, that are encompassed within this philosophical revolution, I guess you'd have to call it, using the word philosophy, uh, to cover uh, all branches of knowledge. Well, where do you start? The, I, I suppose the truth is you can start any place, because this is a comprehensive system, and uh, uh, one, one starting point is just as good as another. Uh, part of the dilemma uh, came to me in visual images, one that I was uh, thinking of uh, <coughs> as I made these notes here was that it was a little like my apple tree, that uh, it's like apples popping, in the, they, they all come ripe at about the same time. And this is what's been happening, uh, this is a way of saying what I'd like to say is that uh, approximately the same kind of thing has been happening in every area of human life. Uh, what I was aware of as a psychologist, uh, the revolution developing within psychology, was uh, a simultaneous uh, development within that field of uh, something similar going on in every other field. And then again you get the German word, the zeitgeist, the, the spirit of the time. And that spirit of the time shows itself everywhere I look, uh, and probably uh, any places I haven't looked yet. Um, this is a, a, a general revolution, I think it's fair to say. In each of the fields of knowledge, in each of our social institutions, uh, that these goings on have been uh, by people unknown to each other, as I keep discovering every week or two or three, some part of this, some um, how shall I say, precipitation of this zeitgeist in some area that I've turned to for the first time and then I find something is happening there uh, which could also be called uh, humanistic, perhaps, uh, which seems to be the word that uh, I think we're falling into the habit of speaking now about humanistic psychologists and humanistic economists and humanistic anthropologists and so on. And then this is confusing itself, um, and I, I sweated over these notes trying to make some kind of order, some, some sensible way of describing that uh, if, you, if you talk about this, uh, this broad front uh, uh, change in, in philosophy, that at the very same time that that's happening, if you'd call this, let's say, the humanistic revolution, uh, the turn back to human needs, essentially, as the center of knowledge and the center of concern, 
uh, that if you call this the humanistic philosophy, at the very, b before this darn thing has really got organized itself, uh, from within its own bowels is emerging, uh, yet the, the next step, uh, and we are already speaking of the transhumanistic, and that's, I, I, it's very hard to describe that. It's a little like an un, unborn embryo becoming pregnant. I, I don't know how else to say it. And, <laughs> and then what do you do about it? Uh, how, how, how can you organize that? It's like uh, catching something en passant. It's developing very, very rapidly. We have the time dimension. It doesn't stand still long enough for for us to get uh, orderly and organized and to have a really good, solid, professor-type lecture with point one, point two, point three, and then sub-point A, sub-point A, A, and, and so that you can have nice notes at the end of an hour. I don't know what kind of notes you could have at the end of this hour, um, but let me try. Supposing now without... Uh, uh, trying so desperately as I've been doing, so I've got very wound up about this, uh, uh, trying to be uh, academic about it, orderly, I should say, but without giving up the effort to separate this uh, humanistic from the transhumanistic, um, and speaking of them both perhaps is the third psychology, that's uh, within the uh, sphere of psychology, we've been talking about third fourth or third stream, uh, and or the third psychology, uh, and what I just spoke about as transhumanistic psychology could properly be called a fourth psychology, even. Supposing I give up the effort, give up this conflict of trying to separate them out from each other and speak of them uh, together. Now, if I had to define this, uh, what I consider most, uh, if I were asked what was most important in this broad revolution, um, I've been thinking very hard about this and trying to boil it down, and I think it boils down to just these few points. First of all, it's a centering of knowledge, of epistemology, of metaphysics, of science, and of all human concerns on human needs and on human experience. Now, that sounds, I'm sure that sounds very obvious and unbreathtaking to, to most of you. Maybe, because that, maybe it's because you don't know enough <laughs> to get confused. <laughs> the professionals uh, have been working, if you were to read the history of uh, philosophy, let's say, or the history of psychology, and if you really got wound up in it, uh, got soaked in it, you'd find that this is, in fact, a new departure. That this, in one sense, is a departure from the uh, classical German intellectual style of moving from the abstract and the a priori, and deriving everything from that, and having the kind of, uh, oh, the Leibniz, uh, uh, and, and uh, that would be a good example, of the, or the Kantian kind of structure where a professor figures everything out. And it's all in big words, abstract words, uh, and it, with a lesser German professors, commonly uh, you could call them helium-filled words. They, they have no connection with the earth, uh, particularly. Um, and this, uh, I know how to say it, this is, the, this is what Kierkegaard and Nietzsche revolted against. This was the turn back from system in the old German style, uh, from abstraction, from a, a priori, from uh, big notions that were figured out, uh, from which reality, so to speak, was derived. Now, what we're doing, uh, partly following the phenomenologists and the existentialists, what we're doing now, and what I'm saying now, that the humanistic psychology is doing, is coming back uh, to the prime reality, which is human experience itself, and starting from there, and then deriving the concepts, the abstractions, the definitions, from this base of real uh, human experience, and also of human needs, human values, human goals. 
Now, this contrasts in another way. If I make it within psychology, I think any of you who are workers in other uh, intellectual fields uh, can very easily parallel what I'm saying. <coughs> now, within psychology, uh, the, the, the great psychologies were the behavioristic, the objectivistic, uh, the positivistic, uh, which essentially can be described as uh, modeling itself upon the successful sciences, which have been physics and chemistry and astronomy and geology and so on, generally the science of things, the science of objects. Uh, some people have called it mechanomorphic. And uh, the, the rationale there is, look, uh, look how physics is the most successful science, and uh, the best thing we can do is to emulate our predecessors and do it in the same way. And uh, it is possible. Uh, there is a, a, certainly a large literature. I won't call it, uh, it well, it's, it's sort of anemic, but, but it's certainly large, uh, of uh, the... Uh, a great deal of information that has been obtained by the psychologists uh, approaching the human being, studying the human being as if you were an object, as if you were a thing. That is, with the same procedures, the same methods, the same concepts, the same definitions, uh, the same attitudes uh, that you would uh, have for studying, let's say, the, uh, the nature of a, of a metal, perhaps. Well, you would say this is the mechanomorphic. Uh, the second psychology is Freudian, uh, and with a penumbra of all kinds of uh, modifications around it. And this, I think, again, over simply, we could identify with the second great uh, step in science, the, I, I think, the Darwinian uh, revolution. And uh, this is... Uh, uh, if you'll permit me to say it very, very briefly and very succinctly, uh, this is the uh, treating the, the study of the phyletic scale and the, uh, the, the, the evolutionary scale and the tendency to uh, then to treat the human being uh, as if he were an animal, which of course he is, but as if he were merely an animal, only an animal, so that the uh, the animal characteristics which he, the human species, has, which no other species has, uh, these are not considered uh, somehow scientific uh, uh, questions. Um, and the only things that uh, tend to get studied by uh, those psychologists who model themselves on the life sciences, uh, Freud himself had a training in neurology and comparative anatomy and so on, uh, that um, frequently what it comes down to is that uh, that is scientific about, that can be studied scientifically about the human being, which he has in common with lower animals. Somehow, if, if he does not have it in common with lower animals, then it's, uh, it doesn't count, or it's not to be studied, or it's not scientific. And Freud had something of the sort. Um, the, the, the high, let's say the peculiarly human qualities, what we might call the higher qualities, uh, the lower qualities we share with other animals, the higher qualities that are unique to the uh, human beings, uh, these higher qualities, these higher aspirations, higher values, are what, what Freud then had to feel reductive about. That is, uh, it's quite rare to find, uh, let's say, altruism or uh, kindness. Uh, uh, you find it in some of the, some animals, some infra-human animals, but it's in a very rudimentary form. Uh, this is uh, especially human. Uh, the Freudian tendency, at least the Freudian tendency as written down, no good clinician, of course, does this in his actual practice, but as written down systematically, uh, the tendency for Freud was to reduce it, to, to make an animal explanation of it somehow, or a pessimistic ep explanation, or as I, uh, uh, in my own notes someplace, I have a file called uh, Proctopsychology, uh, following the medical specialty of proctology, uh, which is the, 
the study of the rectum and the anus and so on, uh, it's perfectly true that this is an entrance to the human body and it's one way of approaching the subject, but, uh, <laughs> but to say the least, there are other ways. <laughs> I would say that a second big point here in the humanistic psychology is that uh, these, these human needs which I spoke about are what we can fairly call higher needs. And furthermore, these higher needs are biologically based. They're part of the human essence, I would say, part of the species character. I invented the word for it, which I thought was very good. Uh, I like it, but I get knocked on the head by my colleagues for it. It's called instinctoid, meaning it's not an instinct, but it's instinct-like in the sense of being uh, genic uh, to an appreciable extent uh, determined by, <coughs> by genes. Now, these higher human needs are therefore biological. I speak here of love, the need for love, for friendship, for dignity, for self-respect for individuality, for self-fulfillment, and so on. Uh, these needs, uh, there's, let's say, though there's not uh, really final clinching evidence, you cannot say that this has been very, very finally demonstrated, but there's certainly a very considerable amount of evidence uh, to make this uh, a very plausible, uh, reasonable uh, hypothesis. That's especially true for the love needs. There, by the way, I should say that it is quite well and certainly uh, supported. It's as if um, you might say that this is like saying something about higher feelings for human nature. It's a way of saying that perhaps human nature has through history been sold short that the higher possibilities or the conception of the human being as needing and wanting dignity biologically and therefore one could say as having a right to it or one might consider this one of the, the fundamental human rights um, because it's in the same sense that it's a human right to have enough uh, calcium and vitamins and cod liver oil and, and, and so on in that sense that uh, this also can be called uh, a human right. It's part of human nature. Uh, if these needs are not fulfilled, then we know very well at the clinical level, pathology results. People get sick. They get sick in all kinds of ways. Some of these ways perhaps I'll have time to describe, these new pathologies that come from selling human nature short, as you might say. Now, out of this, out of this womb, you might say, um, no, let me say it in another way. Supposing we take the people who have been uh, gratified in these higher human needs, the ones, the fortunate ones, who do exist, by the way. These are not figments of the imagination. You can find them. They do exist. People who have been satisfied in these basic needs, people who do feel loved, and who are able to love, and who do feel safe and secure, and who do feel respected, and who do have self-respect. Then if you take such people, and if you study them, and if you ask what motivates them, then you find yourself in another realm altogether. And here I think I would have to start talking about transhumanistic. That is, meaning that the motivations of uh, that which moves that which gratifies, that which uh, pays uh, the fortunate and developed and psychologically healthy and basic need fulfilled person, the self-actualizing person is one name for it, um, that if you ask what motivates these people, then the answer that I've been finding is that these, are, these people are now motivated by something beyond the basic needs, uh, and these are uh, the intrinsic values, values of various sorts. Um, 
I find it very difficult to squeeze that into a minute or two. Um, but I think, let me, let me say this uh, simply as a reference. There's a great deal of information which is now available on fortunate people working under the best conditions um, and choosing their own lives and then responding my, the, the question that I used as I investigated, the one question that turned out to be most important and most fruitful was to ask at first, these were creative scientists, very, very good scientists, I asked them the question, which are the moments in which you get the greatest kicks, the greatest satisfactions? What do you live for? Why is it that you'll clean these darn test tubes for, for three years, you'll work and sweat and so on? Most jobs are mostly dishwashing and chores and cleaning up the floor and so on. Uh, practically any job you can think of is mostly sweat. Uh, what are the great moments, what are the moments of reward which make all this sweating and, and cleaning worthwhile? Now, the answers to those questions were in terms of ultimate human verities, of people reporting one way or another. Um, and this is going to be published, by the way, uh, in the Journal of Humanistic Psychology. The editor is here, so we should put in a plug for it. Next number of the Journal of Humanistic Psychology. Uh, there's a detailed account of the way in which with tables and lists of the kinds of answers that you get to such questions, and uh, with some uh, demonstration of how it is uh, reasonable uh, to call these uh, the ultimate values, or the values of being, or what I call the, for short, the B values, or what uh, Bob Hartman has called the intrinsic values, truth and goodness and beauty and perfection and excellence and uh, simplicity, uh, elegance, and so on and so on. Now, what this amounts to is that this third psychology is giving rise now to a fourth transhumanistic psychology in dealing with transcendent experiences and with transcendent values, transcendent in the sense of what I've been saying there is that the the fully developed and the very fortunate human being working under the best conditions uh, tends to be motivated by values which transcend his self. That is, they are not selfish anymore in the old sense. They are now perhaps selfish, if you want to use the word, in a new sense, a higher sense. Perhaps we could say a transcendent sense. Uh, beauty, after all, is not within one's skin. Uh, justice or order or lawfulness is, uh, I could hardly say that this is uh, selfish in the same sense that my greed for food might be, uh, which uh, 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 nourishes my self. But the, my need for, uh, my satisfaction in justice is not within my own skin, and it doesn't lie along my arteries. It's equally outside as, as inside. And therefore, it has transcended the geographical limitations of the self. And so you can fairly, it makes a certain sense there to talk about transhumanistic uh, psychology. One thing that this means, which is especially important, is that it implies, see, I've been talking about values here. And I claim to be talking about values. If, if I had wanted to, I could have kept on my cap and gown and, and <laughs> spoken as a scientist. I claim to be speaking as a scientist. Uh, a scientist out exploring the wilderness, it's true, uh, not the main traveled road, but yet uh, this is empirical stuff. And uh, what I have just been saying is something which can be confirmed or disconfirmed by anybody sitting here who wants to go to the trouble. It's up for grabs, so to speak. It can be checked. It can be either verified or, or falsified, one or the other. And this is uh, clearly within the jurisdiction of, this is a scientific statement, I would say. Now, what I have done there 
has been to deny the whole modern history of science, which has, from its very beginnings, claimed and needed to be, as a matter of fact, value-free, value-neutral, value-rejecting. If you'll remember that science started that way, uh, uh, cleaning the, the uh, churches, cleaning the, uh, the values which were purported to be uh, revealed to particular priests or, the, uh, or to the nobility or to the higher classes or to, who, to whoever, uh, that these values were, and wishes and desires, were removed from the universe by the original astronomers and uh, students of mechanics and of uh, physics in general and of uh, geology and so on. And very rightly so. Uh, the, the truth is that the world of objects and of things is in this sense certainly value-free. But I would remind you that human beings are not value-free. That they live by values, they live for values, this is the validation of life itself, um, as can be found out. And so that what we have here is a rejection of the model of metanomorphic science, that is a value-free science. And this is also a rejection then of the tendency to technologize, that is to make all the applied sciences, meaning all the professions, as I see it, uh, the, the very powerful tendency to technologize uh, education and nursing and social work and everything else I can think of practically is people become uh, experts and uh, uh, and say to non-experts don't you interfere with this this is not your business uh, that uh, this can be described perhaps I'll have time to do it uh, can be described as technologizing the professions in the sense of making them, or of trying to make them value-free, of trying to make them simply technique, to be efficient, to do it well. But don't ask the question about what it is that you're supposed to do well. In my school of social work on my campus, it's, uh, it's kind of the West Point of social work, I guess, uh, they give the PhDs in social work, uh, which I think that means you have the right to wear two caps and gowns if you want to. Uh, and the, uh, the, everybody's busy running around there working at doing things better, being more efficient, more capable, more expert, but they don't have a social philosopher in the place. And every time I have raised a question with my friends in the school about uh, what is the good society? Uh, everybody looks embarrassed. Uh, <laughs> I think again of the, the, the marvelous thing which I've, I've quoted in, in several times, I think, I, because I like it well. It, it's very meaningful about this, this true story which I was told about the uh, test pilot who radioed back, uh, I'm lost, but I'm making record time. <laughs> another thing, another, what shall I call it, characteristic um, of this new third and fourth humanistic and transhumanistic development uh, that's going on which comes out of, uh, which emerges and is generated by some of the things I've, <laughs> I've talked about, is a, um, a re-sacralizing, a re-spiritualizing. The value-free science is a desacralizer. That is, it makes things uh, natural and positivistic. Uh, takes in what can be taken in, that is, that those are data which, which are available to the senses. This would be a simple definition of positivism. And we have something new if you open the door to values and to the value experiences and to the peak experiences, which I'd like to say something about, uh, then you have opened the door 
since the peak experiences in the first place, since these experiences happen. Nobody has denied this. I mean, they do happen. They can be described I even for uh, just for uh, show-off purposes uh, did some experiments with, uh, with a computer. It's possible to make tables and you know, correlations and so on. Uh, you can, uh, there's a kind of a, a technology of peak experiences if you want. Uh, that's a nice technology, however. If you accept this as part of the natural world, and remember we have already accepted human experience as part of the natural world, human experience as data, respectable data, then you find that there are many, the, the reports from people uh, in peak experiences uh, parallel very frequently the, the reports of the great mystics, of the, the religious mystics, for instance. And they talk about uh, the unity of consciousness, for instance. Or, uh, as also the, the Zen Buddhists do, speak of uh, the eternal in the temporal. Uh, they, speak, they speak many, they use many words which for value-free science have been excluded from the jurisdiction of science and have been turned over uh, to, uh, let's say, uh, the, the professional uh, religious people, uh, the, the poets, the dramatists, the novelists, uh, and, and so on, uh, and have been excluded as not scientific, meaning, without it being said, meaning not really knowledge. It's a, it's a, these are emotions, perhaps, or wishes, or desires, uh, but they're not really fact. They're not really emotions. Well, one thing that has to be said about um, a, a technical thing here that, that has to be said because there are uh, there's great, the possibilities of great confusion here, um, as I know very well because I've gone through the confusions, um, that what, what this has, let me put it this way, what this has developed out of has been uh, a, a value orientation to start with, that is, of selecting out people who were, uh, the self-actualizing people that I talked about, were very healthy people, psychiatrically, psychologically healthy people. Now, you could say superior if you wanted to. Um, or, uh, as I've studied, very creative people, very talented people, and more recently, very strong, powerful characters, that this is already a selection out of the population. In a certain sense, I and others have been studying not really the whole human species in the ordinary statistical sense, not the average of the species, not a good sampling at all, but a very special sampling. A sampling uh, really of, the, let's say, the, the best one in a hundred. Best meaning in these various, in, in creativeness perhaps, or in intelligence perhaps, or in a talent, uh, or in strength, or whatever. Now, this is a kind of statistical approach, and it's a very peculiar one, it's a very unusual one. I've learned to call it growing tip statistics, following the biologists who, uh, if you remember, for instance, your botany, you remember about the growing tip, that this was where all the action takes place, all the, the chromosomes dividing like mad, where in the rest of the, let's say, the tree trunk, uh, the chromosomes are they're, uh, very stable, they're not dividing, uh, they're doing nothing. Uh, the, the woody part of the trunk of a tree is, uh, is it's not really active in the same sense that the growing tip is, uh, let's say on your evergreens, where it even has a different color of green. Uh, if you examine that under the microscope, you'll find that that's where the growth takes place. That's where the action is. And this is, in a certain sense, 
what I've done as a technique is pulling out uh, what you might call the best specimens uh, rather than of uh, studying the whole of the population. Um, now, this, I think I can justify this in various ways, quite apart from the, all the startling things we've learned from this technique, but uh, in the sense that, uh, that for instance, um, the Olympic gold medal winners, let's say, are, represent uh, the human, the limits of human potential for every new baby that's born into the world. Because um, when I was a youngster um, and, and trying to run on the track team, then a uh, hundred yards, uh, it, was, it was humanly impossible to run a hundred yards in less than 10 seconds. And it was humanly impossible to run a mile in less than, I forget the numbers now. But in each of these events, what was humanly impossible has become possible because it was demonstrated, somebody did it. And each time that someone did it, the potentials, the horizons, the ceilings for every newborn baby lifted. In a certain sense, these are the potentials for all human beings. You can pick the Olympic athletes if you like, and that's about what I've been doing. This is a technique for selecting out the most fully evolved, the most fully developed, uh, a word that I think is fair, the most fully human, even in the statistical sense, and then uh, saying that this is what, in principle, what the whole human species can be like if you just let them grow, if, if the conditions are good, and if you get out of their way. This is definitely not an average sample. It's a growing tip sample, or the best of 1%. Also, from study of such people came the, uh, um, certainly my great absorption, now the absorption of many other people with these peak experiences, uh, with these uh, uh, great mystical experiences, which had been thought to be quite rare, but which we now know are not, not rare, and furthermore, which are quantified. There are great ones and middle-sized ones and little ones, and you can talk about peak, that's P-E-A-K, by the way. Uh, you can talk about peak experiences, you could also talk about about uh, uh, foothill experiences, for instance. Or following that, as a, a recent uh, a finding, that uh, the older people, uh, as the peak experiences in the great uh, big emotional ecstasies, uh, tend to get less in number, and you have to see more of what can be called uh, following the same paradigm there, a plateau, high plateau experience, a sort of a uh, serene uh, cognition of being, you might call it, a, a quiet uh, a cognition of, uh, of heaven, uh, so I remember once called it, sort of being lounging in heaven, You're not getting all excited about it. <laughs> Now, let me, I made a list here of, uh, that I'd like to turn to, to give, to, to pass on some of the sense that I have of this revolution along the total front that's going on, uh, this revolution that I've been talking about here, this uh, third and fourth revolution. What does this mean for these various fields? Now, I think I have time uh, for, oh, let's say a word or two about each of them. First of all, we're dealing with a new image of man. Now, I think that's most important because from that, everything else flows. Uh, all of man's works, all of man's institutions, and that, by the way, includes science, and it includes all the sciences. Uh, mathematics and physics are also human institutions. They are generated by human nature. They're made possible by human nature. The only scientists I've ever known were members of the human species, human, human beings. The image of man generates everything else we're going to talk about. And this image of man is 
uh, as I've already uh, said, you, you, it, it's taller. It's, uh, there are more possibilities in this. The ceilings are higher. The potentials are greater. We can expect more by way of possibility from these people. Secondly, second only on my list, uh, which is arbitrary, the interpersonal relations. Out of this has come uh, certainly already uh, a greater conception of human love. That is, the, the, there's a hierarchy of loves, you might say. And love at the, uh, at the highest level that, uh, that I've described it at, anyhow, love for the being of the other person uh, rather than uh, mutual customer satisfaction, so to speak, <laughs> uh, that this, uh, this love, this be love, if you'll permit me that, that abbreviation, uh, this be love is, is another, is a higher conception of what is possible in the human being. Not necessarily what exists in large quantity, but what is possible, what is the human potential. This is also true for sex, uh, we have um, now, again, this, uh, this has given us a notion of higher ceilings for sexuality, uh, especially uh, in the love relationship, uh, that uh, sex can be seen at its highest level, the most fortunate levels, as, uh, as a trigger for peak experiences, for mystical experiences. You say it very bluntly as one of the, one of the gates to heaven. This is possible although not at all common, not really common at all. Well, this itself opens up a realm for science to explore, because as we find, uh, if you actually examine the sexual lives of actual people, and if you take a, a real sampling of the population, you find that 99% uh, of the population don't really know what the possibilities of sexuality are. That is, they don't know how high the ceilings can be. And this is a realm for empirical work, for investigation. Uh, you can do researches with it. This is, I think, true. One thing I've got interested in only recently is as it dawned upon uh, me and some of my friends, um, although now in retrospect I can see that we've talked about it a great deal, that the conception of friendship is also hierarchical and that there are higher levels of friendship which are possible. And then as you study, as you study what friendship can be, rarely, what it can be, what it might be under the best circumstances, then it throws into very cruel and cold relief what friendships actually are. And then not very much by contrast with what they can be. Well, this opens up again, if you become conscious of it, because of these higher ceilings, that is because of this way of looking for a higher level, and uh, you can get the, the vision there of a higher kind of authentic uh, friendship, and then you turn around and look and see that it's missing, uh, this can spur you on again to, to research, to therapeutic work perhaps, to trying to make it come to pass as you get this vision. This is true for the family. It's true for the teacher-child relationship. Uh, we have, uh, I should say, higher conceptions being developed, being generated out of the humanistic and the transhumanistic psychology. One great uh, thing, which is uh, perhaps I ought to separate from the image of man, the new image of society and especially of the relationship between man and society. At the lower levels of, uh, let's say at the second level, by contrast with this third and fourth level, uh, society, civilization is seen, and its interests are seen as in necessary mutual exclusive contrast to the interests of the individual. What is good for the individual is bad for civilization. That is, if he were selfish, if he let himself go, uh, if he were impulsive and so on, if he didn't control himself, then civilization would fall. This is the Freudian conception, for instance. There is, uh, following Ruth Benedict, one of the great anthropologists, a new conception of a higher possibility 
of, if I could say it uh, briefly, uh, the healthy society. It's possible there are tools now available for judging societies from outside the society. And that's the, of course, the death of cultural relativity is a total philosophy of anthropology. One society can be judged to be better than another society or healthier or in terms of suitability for, let's say, one of the words we're using now, growth fostering. One society is more growth fostering than another, we could say. Or we can talk about, as we talk here, about the value of a society or the function of a society, that is, for the greatest self-actualization, the greatest coming to fulfillment of the, of the people in the society. That's a value. And we know something about it. This is generating a different notion of reality, most peculiarly, of objectivity. It turns out there's kind of a higher conception of objectivity than the one that we know. I can't resist taking one moment at least to talk about it. I'm going to run over time. Maybe I will spend that four hours after all <laughs> that I have notes for. Uh, if the, the notion of objectivity that the scientist now has is uh, what you might call the spectator objectivity of not caring, that is being neutral about the matter, of it doesn't matter to him who wins and who loses, so to speak. Well, we have something emerging from the study of, of the be-love relationship where you can have love for the problem. It's not necessarily only for a human being. Uh, it's possible to have love enough for a human being, for your child, for instance. If you have great love for your child, it's possible to leave him alone. It's a great achievement. Um, and it's possible to leave him alone in the Taoistic sense because you love him so much the way he is that you just delight in watching him grow. Uh, this can be said for apple trees, too, or for animals, or, or for whatever. Uh, that you, it turns out that um, it, it's possible that via, let me put it this way, via loving at a very high level, it is possible to become objective, detached, non-intrusive, non-interfering, able to leave it alone so that you can let it be itself. And it begins to appear that in such a spirit, from such a spirit comes the greatest perspicuity, the greatest accuracy of perception. Because the opposite of being it alone perception is our normal perception of is it can I make use of it? Is it good for me? Is it bad for me? Can I profit from it? Is it threatening to me? Is it dangerous to me? Can I eat it? <laughs> and so on. And this means always necessarily seeing in an abstract way. It means not seeing the whole of the thing. It means seeing only, let's say, it's, whether it's edible or not edible, which means seeing only part of it, which means therefore seeing inaccurately. Permitting yourself to see the whole of it, therefore, would be seeing it more accurately. And this is, though at first it sounds like a paradox, uh, I don't think it is really. Perhaps a word about religion, uh, considering the uh, locale. Uh, <laughs> the, um, and let this uh, serve for many of the things that I could say about the uh, professionalizing. Um, it seems to me that the, uh, if you focus upon the religious experience, and or better said, if you, as, as happens in fact to me, focusing upon the peak experience and then finding the peak experience to have almost all of the characteristics traditionally attributed to religious experiences that I got to think of these as small r religious experience, universal religious experience, 
not having anything to do necessarily with one creed or another or one place or another, then it turns out that if this is so, that uh, we have uh, uh, paradoxes again. One can talk of the religionizing, you might say, or the sacralizing of all of life. Now that would mean a contradiction to what actually happened. The religious day is Sunday. The other days you don't have to be, have these feelings at all. Or characteristically, uh, there are holy places or places in which when you walk in the door then you're supposed to feel the religious feeling and you have that religious feeling until you walk out the door and then you drop it and you needn't have religious feeling anymore. The contrast with that compart that expertizing, you might say, or specializing, specializing the day, the building, the person, the moment, uh, that the contrast is then with the religionizing or the spiritualizing of all of life. Uh, presumably, and as a matter of fact, empirically I can report that these peak experiences can take place any place or at any time and to anyone. Now, this can be said for education, that humanistic education, I think it could be demonstrated if we had the time, humanistic education means uh, educationalizing the whole of life rather than having education take place in one kind of building, not outside, and of having uh, one kind of person specialized as a teacher. If this uh, New York City teacher strike lasts long enough, we may learn a great deal about real education. Um, the mothers and neighborhood people and all sorts of uh, non-experts are coming into school. There are no examinations being given, no grades. Uh, there may really be a great uh, step forward there as a possibility. Um, I don't count on it um, because I, I, as I suspect that the experts will get things well in hand again. Um, and we'll start throwing education again into, into three credit slices, you know, uh, like the slices of a tangerine, somehow they all turn out to be equal uh, and to fall apart and to be separate from each other. Um, that, uh, do you get the picture there? I could go on with it. Uh, uh, <laughs> What I'm trying to say is that um, all of life can be educationalized, all of life can be religionized, if you think in terms of the ultimate values, rather than of the expertness, rather than of the technology, rather than of the expertise, rather than of the specialties, all of life can be and should be aestheticized. I know this was a great uh, illumination for me when it um, dawned on me that you can make life itself into an artistic product. You can make your home into an artistic product. You can uh, come, I was, I was in a, a home last night in which, which was an artistic, everything was beautiful. <laughs> and there, this is quite different from our way of only artists, certified artists, preferably with a diploma from someplace, uh, and who have a studio and who say, I am an artist. And then they do particular things on canvas, for instance, that's all right. Uh, with, with, uh, with your wallpaper at home, that's not art. Uh, that's something else. Or with, your, with fabrics or whatever, uh, this would be different. And there again you have a technologizing even of beauty, a separation off of the experts and the humanistic contrast there is with the aestheticizing of all of life. The same thing is true of the therapeutic experience and the personal growth fostering, that therapy can fill all of life also. Um, all of life can be, or any part of life can be sacralized. All of life can be philosophized. 
the, as a matter of fact, there's a good example. Uh, the professors of philosophy have not been, I mean, there have been, most of the history of philosophy comes from non-professors of philosophy. Uh, professors of philosophy, many of them, a very large proportion of them, are those who, who make commentaries upon the actual philosophizing, uh, which have been done by uh, a lens maker, grinder, uh, and by people who had other titles altogether, like, uh, let's say, like Freud, the psychiatrist, and so on. Let me say, last, in my capacity as a scientist, of, and of trying to make it clear that, that I'm speaking no, let me back up and take it from another angle. That let me talk to the point of, um, is this optimistic? Now, the answer there is that it's neither optimistic nor pessimistic, that our job as empirical people is to be realistic, to be good reporters, good observers. What is actually the case? Now, in this instance, um, I know that the people who, uh, many of the humanistic psychologists, for instance, are called neo-Rousseauists, or that they believe in inevitable progress, or one recent, uh, who was it, who accused this group of uh, believing that man uh, can, uh, can become perfect, um, and accused them also of denying the possibility of evil, that, let me say that all of these possibilities that I have been talking about are, in fact, possibilities. These are possibilities which have been described in about, let's say, a, a fraction of 1% of the population. It would be possible to talk about the healthiest 1%, or the most creative 1%. This is a realistic statement. It's a statement of the realistic or empirical in the sense, first of all, that everything that has been said here can be confirmed or disconfirmed, verified or falsified. It can be put to the test. Secondly, it's possible for each of these statements to talk in statistical terms, that is, in arithmetical terms, talk about the degree of reliability. How reliable is this? How sure are we that this is so? What does it mean about this growing tip statistics that I spoke about? Now, Will this actually happen? This also is an accusation against the humanistic psychologists and the humanistic sociologists and so on, uh, that they are assuming that this must inevitably come about. The answer is, uh, so far as I can make out, no, it's not necessary that it should come about. This whole darn place might be wiped out. The atom bombs are still sitting around and waiting. It's possible that they might win, but it's also possible that they might not win. It's possible that this, if we get the scientific vision, that is the empirical vision of something which is in truth a human potential, which therefore can conceivably be actualized, that these are all not pipe dreams, but clear possibilities, then this brings it well within the realm of human activity. I think what I'd like to wind up with is that what this, uh, certainly what this means to me anyhow, is the possibility of, of hope. That is, this has to be said, I, it wouldn't have had to be said 20 or 30 years ago, but in this day, when there is so much uh, despair and anguish and death wish and people giving up and people saying you can't improve anything and the only thing you can do is to protest and um, that it's no use trying to improve the society, it's no use trying to improve people, it's no use trying to improve anything, that uh, I would say that everything that I have been talking about and all the data, piles of it, which, upon which those statements are based, deny the necessity of uh, anguish, despair, giving up of hopelessness, and do leave the possibility of hope in the sense of if you work hard, perhaps you can bring these things about.
Oh, great. Ten minutes, right. 